Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? We're going to continue our study on getting to know the God that we may not know. I have a few more messages on this before we end this series. Then I'll be going into a series for the winter, just to get you a little geared up. The series for the winter is going to be how to prepare for the rapture. How we prepare for the rapture. How we looking for the rapture. And is it possible that the rapture could happen any time? How many say yes? Amen. Amen. It is imminent. It can happen at any time. We have seen that God is holy, yet do we know Him as holy? We have seen that God is faithful, but do we know His faithfulness? We know He is eternal. We know He is changeless. We know He is powerful. We know He is good. We know that He is all-knowing. We know that He is sovereign. And today we're going to see that we know that He is ever-present. How many of us think that we can hide from God? That we can run away from God and, and find a place, a little place in this, on this earth, this planet that we call earth, and find a place where we would not be seen by Him. Is there such a place? No, there is not. God is not subject to time. We have seen that. God is eternal. God is not subject to space. God can be everywhere at one time. One of the remarkable statements that Jesus goes and makes for you and for me is the fact that He will send to us the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is not subject to place. He is not subject to just one, one little section at a time. The Holy Spirit of God can be right here, and I trust He is right here with us, as well as He can be over in Japan working in services in Japan or Russia or all over the world, he can be there at the very same time in which he is here. Isn't that a remarkable fact about our God? That's who our God is. But I have to wonder, I have to look at ourselves and say, well, do we really know him as a God who is everywhere at one time? Do we know that he is, he is not subject to time? Do I know that he is not subject to space? Do I know that he can be with me where I am and he can be with, with whoever, any place else in the world? Do I know that he can be everywhere at one time? Give me Isaiah 57, please. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Watch what it says. For thus says the high and the lofty one, that inhabiteth what? Eternity. <coughs> what does that mean to you, me? He inhabiteth eternity. He always has been. There is no beginning with God. None. You and I have a hard time thinking of that. You and I have a hard time valuing that in our mind, because our mind just, we're so subject to time, we're so subject to space, we're so subject to, to those things around us. But the Word of God says that the high and the lofty one 
is inhabiting or does inhabit eternity. His name is holy. He said, I dwell in the high and the holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and of a humble spirit. So, he goes in the high and the holy place. He is in the temple of temples. He is in eternity. He is on his throne in heaven. For where else is he? He is in the heart of those with a humble and a contrite spirit. Is that you this morning? When we have a, a contrite and a humble spirit, when we say, Lord, I know that I can't do it on myself. I know that I can't control it. I know that without you, I am helpless. I'm like a newborn baby that has to totally depend upon his mom and dad to do everything for him. But that's who we are. And he says, not only does he inhabit and dwell in the high and holy place, but he is with the contrite and the humble spirit. And what does he do with the contrite and the humble spirit? Does he keep us low? Does he keep us beating ourselves up? Does he keep us kicking ourselves all the time? No. What does he do? To revive the spirit of the humble. Isn't that neat? Now, what does it mean to revive the spirit? I'm going to make you alive again. We, this is a song we sing here at CCC quite often. Set my soul, what? A fire, a fire Lord. Lord, put a fire under me. Light me a blaze for you. It says that he, will, he, that he will go and he will revive the spirit of the humble. And he will revive the heart of the contrite one. The one who says, Lord, I can't do it. But Lord, I know you can. Therefore, Paul the Apostle gives you and me instruction where he says, we can do all things through Christ. That's what strengthens us. So he revives the humble. He revives the one with the concrete heart. Not the proud heart. Not the arrogant heart. Not the obnoxious heart. But the humble heart. The heart that is contrite. The heart that is bowed before him. Bowed at his feet. Say, Lord, I can't do it. Lord, I can't do it. But you see, he's there at the high and lofty place, high and holy place, but he's also here with you and with me. Boy, should we be giving him praise or what? Amen. Lord, you are here. How many know that God's here this, this morning? Amen. You know, I look out here and there's a few empty seats, and, and I like to envision this. You know, right there next to Lynn. Hey, Lynn, you look up, there's somebody off to you, to you, right? You know who that is? His name is Jesus. Teresa, right there in that seat next to you, his name is Jesus. He says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Matthew 28. Do we believe that? Do we know him as that? Do we understand him? That no matter where we are, there he is. I think if we did, there may be some places that we wouldn't go. Because why? We'd be dragging him right there with us. How many of us, if we really knew that Jesus was there with us, would go some places that we attend? No, we kind of say, Jesus, just stand out here on the on the on the sidewalk. And, I'll go in and have my good time. No, guess what? If I really knew that Jesus was with me, I wouldn't go there. If I knew that Jesus was there listening to me, there's a lot of things I wouldn't say. Why? Because he's there. He hears me. Not only is he there with me, but he hears everything I do. He knows every thought that I have. You see, in the series which we have, <coughs> you want to excuse me, see God beyond the little pictures in which you and I have of God. I think you and I have a very small picture of who he is. Very minute picture of who God truly is. If we saw him truly as this gigantuous, big, 
awesome God. There may be some things that you and I would do a little bit differently. Because we know that he's always with me. We know that he always hears me. He knows my thoughts. He knows everything I'm thinking. He knows what I'm going to think tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to think in a minute from now. But he does. You see, that's who our God is. So not only is he the faithful one, the holy one, the, the eternal one, the chaseless one, the powerful one, and so forth, he is the ever-present one. If we really get to know him as the ever-present one, I think maybe there are some things that we would really wonder about. Give me Jeremiah 23, would you please? Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. Watch this. <coughs> Am I of God at hand, says the Lord? Am I of God far off? Am I just a God here and not a God who is all over the earth? A God who is in eternity? A God who is seated in the heavens? Am I just a God who is at hand? Am I just a God that you can call upon right now because here I am, but a few minutes from now I'm not here? Is that who I am? Listen what he says to Jeremiah. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? What's the answer to that question? No. no. There is absolutely no place we can hide from his presence. And there's absolutely no place that we can hide that his eye does not see us, that his ear does not hear us, that his understanding does not understand us. There is not one place. He's saying to the prophet uh, uh, Jeremiah, he said, look, you cannot hide in secret places, but I shall not see you, says the Lord. Do not I feel the heavens and what other place? The earth. The earth. Where's that? Right here. Right here. I feel the heavens and all the expanses and all the universes in all the galaxies, they're filled with my presence. But that little tiny planet Earth that I made for you, guess what? I am there also. I'm here. Do you know I feel the heaven and the earth? And who spoke it? Not just Jeremiah speaking this. So many times when we read scripture, we look at it and we say, well, this is what Jeremiah says. Well, wait a minute, who spoke from Jeremiah? God is the one who said it. Jeremiah just wrote it down. Remember, whenever I refer to the Word of God, whenever I refer to this book, this book is not written by 40-some-odd authors. This book is written by one author, God himself. Oh, there's many penmen, but there's only one author, and that is God. Now, when should I come to you? Let me give you three times, or three areas. Now, there's certainly many, many more. I'm just scratching the surface this morning. But how about when we're tempted? When you and I are facing temptation, when you and I are facing something that we know that just might be a little on the shady side, or maybe downright, no, you ought not to be doing that, but I wouldn't do it anyway. Should I go to God with that? Well, why not? We find in Scripture that Jesus says that he was tempted in all ways like us, yet he was without sin. Do you know that Jesus went to the Father when he was tempted? You read about that temptation of Satan when, when he was there in the garden and he had been fasting for 40 days and he was of a, of a tremendously weakened spirit. And he went to the Father. Well, you know, you and I, when we attempted, we ought to go to him too. Well, we have a couple of examples where people didn't go to him. Of course, that will remember the fall. Adam and Eve. Satan comes and he 
questions and he causes Eve to take the, the fruit and then she gives the fruit to Adam and he takes the fruit. They eat the fruit and then God comes down in the dew of the morning to talk with them. And where do, they, where do we find them? We find them hiding. Instead of going to God and saying, God, help me through this. Help me not to do this. They went ahead and did it. They didn't go and seek out God. They just went and did it. And then they hid from God after they did it. How many know the account of Jonah? The scene starts up in Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Jonah has been told by God to do something. What did God tell him to do? Go to Nineveh. Are you sure? I don't want to go to Nineveh. So what does he do? He gets on a ship, tries to sail as far away from Nineveh as he could sail. He runs from God. Instead of going to God and saying, God, you've got to help me to go to Nineveh if, if that's where you would want me to go. And, and Lord, you've got to fix my heart so I would love the Ninevites and, and care for them and want to see them saved. Instead, he runs from them because he hated the Ninevites. They were a wicked people. But he ran from God. When you and I attempted, did we run from God? Did we run away from him because we don't want his presence near us when we're tempted to do something that, that we ought not to be doing? We're tempted to say something that we ought not to be saying. We're tempted to think something that we ought not to be thinking. We're tempted to go against what God's word says and we know that God's word says don't do it, but we run from God and we go and we do it anyway. That's common. Certainly Adam and Eve did it. Certainly Jonah did it. Certainly others did it. Peter. But what are we to do? Give me Hebrews 4.13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest. And the word manifest means what? Made known or revealed. So is not made known or revealed in his, that army of capital H, by the way, sight. But all things, how many things? Oh. All things are what? They are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Where is he? He's right here. And he sees and knows and hears everything. So when you and I are tempted, does that surprise God? Does anything surprise God? No, he knew it before the foundation of the world. He knew it was all going to happen long before you and I knew it was going to happen. So can we go to him when we're being tempted and say, Lord, I can't handle this temptation. I need you to help me. Lord, I need you to give me the strength to say, no, I don't want to do that. But how many of us do not go to God in that problem? Instead, we yield to the temptation. Let me share with you a truth. And I want you to glean this truth. Temptation is not a sin. Did you get it? Temptation is not a sin. You know what the sin is? The sin is when I yield to it. The sin is when I submit to it. Now, how could I say that? Because Jesus was tempted, yet he was without sin. And we know that Jesus Christ is without sin, yet he was tempted. So therefore, his temptation was not sin to him. It's how he would have responded to that temptation. That would have been sin, but because of his perfectness, he responded to it perfectly before the Father, and he did not yield to it. So therefore, that was not accounted to him for unrighteousness. You and I are tempted all the time. But does that mean that, that we're in sin all the time? No, it's just that how I respond to that temptation. It's going to be how God sees it. So we have here, where he goes and says, the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God is there. Let me ask you a question. Where do I go 
Where do you go? How many of us have faced troubles recently? <laughs> Anybody in this room faced any troubles recently? Anybody in this room have had any problems, any situations, any circumstances in your life where you just say, whoo, that's tough. Not yet today. <laughs> Not yet today. <laughs> this afternoon, he's looking forward to it. <laughs> Every single one of us are going through troubling times. And if we stay, we're not relying. All right? Now, let me ask you a question. Where do we go in our trouble? Do we go to him? Or do we try to say, Lord, I can handle this. And then we fall flat on our face. Don't we? I go to, I gotta go to God in my trouble. I gotta go to God when I'm when I'm facing those troubling times, those hard times, those times where, where I just don't know which way to go and how to handle it, what to do with it. Give me Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 5, please. Watch this. This is a great portion. But now thus saith the Lord. Who's speaking? God is. Alright? Now thus saith the Lord that created you, by the way. How many of you did he create? <laughs> all of us, people. Alright? You're not just a blob that happened. Alright? He created all of us. O oh, Jacob. And he that formed you, O oh, Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, and I have called thee by thy name. How many of you know him by name? How many of you know that he knows you by name? Your name is on his lips. Isn't that amazing? The name, Harold Noise, is on the lips of Almighty God. He doesn't just look at me and say, hey, you. you uh, what, what's your name? Um, um, I can't remember. What's your name? That's what I do with my kids all the time. No. <laughs> God knows my name because I am on his lips and in his heart. Don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget that. And it says he calls me by name. And I love that next three, three words. What does the next three words say? Thou art mine. How many are his? If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're his. And if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He's yours. I am His and He is mine. And I tell you what, if you don't, you're missing out big time. Because I know I am His. And I know that He is mine. And He says to Isaiah, Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, what kind of waters? Are those the kind of waters He's talking about? Why do you think there's a troublesome waters? The stormy waters. Right? When I pass, when you pass through the water, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. When thou shalt be, uh, when shall the uh, flame kindle upon thee? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Mm -hmm. Where were they one day? The they are thrown right in the midst of the fire. The king had had put the fire up a thousand times harder than it's ever been before. And when they pulled them out of there, they did not have one hair singed, and they did not smell of smoke. Do you think God was meaning what he said? When you face the fires, guess what, people? I am there. I don't care what fire you're facing today. I don't care what river you're facing today. I don't care what stormy waters you're facing today. He is there. Is that a truth or what? Amen. That is a truth. Man, we as God's people ought to be shouting hallelujah about that. Because He is there. All of us. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Do you like that? How many of you know him as Savior? Do you know him as Savior? I do. I need a Savior. And his name is Jesus Christ. Okay. Daniel sang about it just a moment ago. Who nailed him to the cross? Harold Noyes did. And you put your name there because you nailed him to the cross too. Because he carried your sins upon the cross of Calvary so that you don't have to carry your sins anymore. 
he carried. Listen to what he says. I'm the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Syria for thee. Since thou hast, I was precious in my sight. You are right, you are precious in my sight. Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. Is that a promise we can take to the bank of life? Is he with you today? Is he with you today? No. I don't care if you're going to temptation. Go to him in that temptation. Say, Lord, I can't handle this temptation. Do you know that there's no temptation over taking man but such a problem? And that he will make the way of escape? But you know something? If you don't go to him in your temptation, there's no way for him to make the way of escape. But you go to him in temptation, and he'll make the way of escape. I've known times in my life when, I, when there was something that I kept it up, and the next thing I know, the phone rings. And I answer the phone, I have the conversation with whoever is on the other end, and by the time I hang up the phone, I forget what that temptation was all about. Who made the way of escape? He did. Or someone would come to the door, or whatever the case may be. He said, I will make the way of escape, that thou shalt bear it. Whoa. With me in my temptation, he'll be with me in my troubled times. By the way, everybody's favorite is Psalm. Psalm 23, right? Psalm 23, verse 4. You know what that, what that verse says? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. He does not say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I can't find you. He doesn't say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're nowhere to meet your mound. It doesn't say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with somebody else attending them, and you can't attend me. No, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Ah. Oh. Is he with us? Do I, do I know him that well, that I know that in my times of temptation, he's with me? Do I know him that well that in the times of trouble that he is with me? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. Do I know that? Do you know that? Let me give you the third one. You saw six points, you said, oh no, that's going to be long-winded today. No, actually this is the last one. When I'm facing a hard task, when you're facing a hard task, a task that just seems to be so daunting, you just don't think that you can get through it, where should you go? You should go to him. You should go to him. Give me Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, please. Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, do I walk through what? I'm sorry, that's Psalm 23. Exodus 3, 12. Yeah. And he said, watch this. By the way, who's the he? God. All right? Should be capitalized. He said, you see that next word? What's the next word? Certainly. What does that mean? Most assuredly. Absolutely. No doubt. Right? Certainly I will be where? With you. Now, is that a promise we can take to the bank or what? Yeah. Why? Because he said so. God said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of, out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses, don't you dare be afraid to go before Pharaoh. Because I tell you what, you go stand before Pharaoh and Pharaoh's going to have to shake in his boots because I'm going to go before you. That is a promise you can take. God gives you and me a witness to share with somebody. Don't be afraid to do it, God, because certainly I'll be with you. I'll be with you. And you can do it. You have a temptation which you're facing that you don't think that you can say no to? Certainly, I will be with you. You have a trouble that you're facing that you just don't understand and you, you're thinking, oh no, this is going to be it, man. 
I can't handle this. This is going to push me over the edge. But God said, certainly, I will be with you. Do you know him like that? Do you really see God that way and have that personal, intimate relationship with him? Whether it be your temptation, whether it be in your troubles, or whether it be in any hot task which God may call you to do. I tell you what, in my 50 plus years of ministry, and you all know this, I have had some daunting tasks. And man, I tell you what, if I could have handed it over to Ed Temple, I would have. <laughs> but you know something? I couldn't hand it over to Ed, or Donnie, or Wayne, or anybody else. I had to do the task. And you know something? I'm here to tell you about it. Because certainly, he was with me. So just as he promised Moses, certainly, I will be with you. Guess what? I will be with you. Give me Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Joshua 1, 5 and 6. Watch this. There shall not any man be able to stand before me all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, we just read about that, certainly I will be with you, Exodus 3. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not, what? I will not fail you. Let me ask you a question. Can anybody stand up from where you're seated right now and say, God was with God ever failed you? Now, you may think he failed you, but you know who failed? You. Because you didn't go to him in your temptation. You didn't go to him in your trouble. You didn't go to him in that daunting task that you were ready to face, and therefore we fell for our offense. What's he say here? I will not fail you, nor will I, what? Forsake you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I won't do it. Do we know God that way? Do we know Jesus Christ that way? Where Jesus Christ will not forsake me? What's he saying at the end of Hebrews? I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. The word never is how long? That's forever and ever and ever and ever. Before time, after time as we know it. I will never, ever. How many have been forsaken by God? Not a one of you. How many of you have God failed? Not a one of you. Not one. He promised this to Joshua. I'll never fail you. I'll never forsake you. So therefore, we can be strong and of good courage. But unto his people, this people shall thou divide for an inheritance of land, which I swear upon uh, unto their fathers to give them. By the way, Israel can land on that verse right now and say, that land is ours and no one is going to take it away from us. No one. Can't do it. Why? Because God gave it to him. And he says, you can be strong and of good courage. And I don't care what temptation you're facing. I don't care what trouble you're facing. I don't care, I don't care what, what difficult task you are facing. He will get you through it. Why? Because he won't fail you, nor will he forsake you. Let me add one more thing. So many people think that they can say a prayer and they'll have salvation for a short period of time and then they'll fail God and God will forsake them and therefore they won't have salvation anymore. Is that true? Uh -uh. How long is eternal life good for? Eternity. How long is everlasting life good for? It's everlasting. You know something? I cannot outlive God's love. I cannot outlive God's grace. I cannot outlive God's faithfulness. I cannot outlive all that God's given to me. And when God told Harold Noyes that he had eternal life, guess what I have? I have eternal life. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Give me John 14, 17, please. One of my favorite portions of scripture, of course, is John chapter 14. But look what he says in verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. So you see, you and I have a very special privilege. 
And you know what that special privilege is? We have the Holy Spirit of God living inside us. The world does not have that. Those who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior does not have the Holy Spirit of God inside them. God cannot live in sinfulness. Only God can live in righteousness, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which you and I take on when we ask Jesus to come into our life and save us. Listen to what he says. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. That means the world does not see him, does not recognize him for who he is, does not understand that he is very God and all God, yet he is all man. But neither knoweth him, but you know him. I hope that everybody in this auditorium, everybody who's watching on camera this morning, I hope you know him. That means I hope you know what it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope you know him that when you fall into a temptation, you can go to him in that temptation and say, Lord, help me get through this. Lord, I don't want to do this thing. Lord, bring, bring a way of escape for me. That I don't have to submit to the, to the wiles of the devil. Do not have to submit to the, to the fiery dots which he's firing at me all the time. I do not have to submit to that. But I can only go through Jesus Christ to, to be victor over it. Do you know him in your trouble? You have a pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. I'm going through the hardest time of my life, and I just, I just don't know if I can handle it. Well, guess what? You can't. So you might as well submit to that. But I know who can. And his name is Jesus Christ. Go to him in your trouble. <clears throat> Go to him in your trouble. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? He is with me. Hope to him in your good times too, Pastor. Yeah. I don't care what time it is. If you're going through good times, praise God. But praise God that he's with you in those good times. But also praise God that when you're going through hard times, he's with you too. Listen to what he says. Look, they do not know him, but you know him. For he what? He dwells. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to give to you the Holy Spirit. And he is spirit, so that each and every one of you who know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, who is living inside of you? I don't know who's living inside of me. Who's living inside of you? The Holy Spirit of God. Come on, people. <laughs> you know what it says? I have the Holy Spirit of God inside me. Keith has the Holy Spirit of God inside me. Darlene has the Holy Spirit of God inside me. All those in the government have the Holy Spirit of God inside me. They know Christ the Savior. So therefore, we are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God that gives me the victory through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Let me ask you a question. Can you have victory over any, any, any temptation? Yes. Absolutely. Can you have victory over any, any, any trial or tribulation you're going through? Yes. Absolutely. Can you have victory over any, any, any difficult task that you may be facing this week? Yes. Absolutely. Wow. Thanks be to God. Give me, can, can you... Type that in, Shane, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, just so everybody sees it. Thanks be to God. That gives us, gives us, it's not that I can have money, not that I can conjure up the money, but God gives it to me. See, thank you to God. It gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Are you living on the victory side this morning? I hope so. I can have victory over temptation. I can have victory over troubles. I can have victory over any task which I'm facing. I can have the victory because I have Jesus Christ living inside of me in the form of the Holy Spirit of God who now dwells in me. Is he dwelling in you? Let me tell you how you can know that he be dwelling in you. You see, the first thing you need to do is you need to recognize that you're a sinner. You need to recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Let me this. 
and he had your sins upon his shoulders. He bore your sin. Remember, I started the sermon with the only sin that Jesus Christ ever knew was yours. <coughs> and the sins of everybody who's ever lived. And the only righteousness you and I will ever know will be his because of what he did upon Calvary's tree. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Hey, you said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, come into my life, save me. I want, I need, I crave eternal life. Jesus, give me that life today. And when you give me that life, give me that life. I need the Holy Spirit of God to dwell in me moment by moment, day by day, week by week. That when I go through trials, when I go through temptation, when I go through the hard tasks, I know that you are with me. And you're going to get me through that. Because you promised. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come in, in to come into your life and save you, just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus, I know that the wages of sin is death. But then there's a three-letter word. My favorite. What is it? What? what? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ my Lord. I have the gift of God this morning. Do you? And his name is Jesus. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much. Lord, that you are so real. And you are so alive. And you so want to live in each and every one of us. Whether it be in the good times in which we can enjoy, love, appreciate, or whether it be in the tough times, the times of temptation, those times of struggles, the times of troubles, those times of hard tasks that we have to face and we don't know how we're going to get through it. But we know that because you are there, you will get us through it because you have never failed us and you never will. You have never forsaken us and you never will. But Father, there may be somebody here this morning who says, Pastor, I don't know this Jesus, but I want to get to know him today. Well, please, just simply say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my life, save me, cleanse me. Make me that new person you want me to be. Jesus, I want to know you like the scriptures tell us about. How real and how wonderful and how personal he can be in each and every one of our lives, every moment of every day. Whatever you had, God, did anybody pray that prayer? I want Jesus to come into my life and save me. I want eternal life this morning. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Or maybe there's some of us who said, Lord, I have failed to come to you in my temptations, and I've yielded to those temptations. But Father, I ask now that you give me the strength, and when I do face temptations, I'll come to you. When I face troubles in my life, I'm going to come to you. When I face those hard tasks in my life, and I don't know how to answer those tasks and do those tasks, Lord, I want to be able to come to you and know that you are always there with me. Lord, help me. Help me. With the indwelling Holy Spirit inside me, you will give us the victory in Jesus Christ. Anybody pray that prayer with me? I pray that prayer. Lord, help me. When I face daunting tasks, Lord, I need you. Anybody know? Praise God. Yes, amen. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise God. I see those hands. Anybody else? Yes, amen. Amen and amen. Yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, Father God, you're so real. You're so personal. You're so intimate. And Father, we want to know you that way. We don't want to see you as a God of far off. We want to know you as a God who dwells in us and lives in us and has made his abode in us through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord Jesus, thank you for the day. Thank you for those that have come out. Thank you for those who will be watching. And Lord God, use us for the glory of Christ Jesus, our Lord. We will thank you in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like 
When I walk by your side, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by 